My name is Barry Winslow. I've been a member of the Board of Directors of the Minnesota Military Appreciation Fund now for more than three years. Uh, and it's my privilege to welcome you here, here this evening. Um, tonight we're going to honor the men and women of Minnesota who have served bravely and with pride and dignity for our country. Uh, but before, before we get the program started and I, and, and I introduce our MC Heidi Collins for Fox 9, uh, I'd like a round of applause for the Red Bull Division Band. You're going to hear them several times this evening, and they are excellent. Well, I'd like to introduce Heidi Collins, and I think most of you know Heidi. She's, uh, she's on Fox 9. Heidi is a Twin Cities native who graduated from Moundsview High School here in the Twin Cities. She came back to Minnesota recently after spending time in Atlanta and New York with CNN, where she was a news anchor and a correspondent for eight years. Three of those years were spent as the anchor of CNN Newsroom with Heidi Collins. In addition to reporting on and interviewing world leaders and U.S. presidents while she was at CNN, she has been at the forefront of several breaking stories. She landed the first exclusive interview with George Bush after the 2008 election. And most recently, she was the first in the nation to break the story that Osama bin Laden had been captured and killed. Her list of credits is very extensive. Two Peabody Awards, an Alfred DuPont Award, an Associated Press Award, and three Edward R. Murrow Awards. And they don't give those to just anybody. She was also selected to attend the National Security Forum at the Air War College at Maxwell Air Force Base. And in her first year with Fox, she has been the recipient of two Emmy Awards. Currently, she anchors Fox at 5 and Fox at 9 with Jeff Passholt. Heidi is very passionate in her support for our troops and veterans. She currently serves on the, as a board member for Tee It Up for the Troops organization. Tee It Up for the Troops has raised more than $4 million since it began in 2005. And I'd like to welcome Heidi Collins to the podium. Hi there, everybody. How are you doing tonight? All right. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I have water uh, with ice. I don't think I need that tonight. It's gotten really cold, and our meteorologist, Ian Leonard, um, got one right. So we're happy about that. Uh, I would love to uh, take a moment to recognize uh, the 34th Infantry Division Red Bull Band there, um, as Barry so kindly did. Uh, just the other day, we were mentioning a story about how this division is getting ready to welcome back uh, 2,700 of its members uh, in the spring, coming home and coming home for good. So good for them. Thanks for your service and sure to appreciate it. So thank you so much for joining me here tonight. Um, I had the pleasure of getting to know Roger Sitt um, pretty much right when I came to Minneapolis-St. Paul, came back to Minneapolis-St. Paul after 13 moves around the country with uh, the television stuff and the Air Force stuff. My husband, a great proud vet veteran of the United States Air Force, flew the F-111 for a while and uh, did some great things for Operation Provide Comfort. So I am proud to be the wife of as well and uh, everything that you do for our troops and our troops are doing for themselves and for our country is of uh, great importance to me and so appreciated. Um, tonight, we are going to be honoring the men and women of Minnesota in particular who have done so much and have provided our country with the best protection that we could ever hope to have. Uh, they have served with pride and with dignity. And so we say thank you, thanks to be particular, to the sons and the daughters, the husbands and wives, mothers and fathers who answered the call to serve the United States of America. And we say thanks to you, those who support Minnesotans Military Appreciation Fund and its mission. The tradition of welcoming home soldiers returning from battle is, an old, is as old as war itself. MMAF's tradition today of offering cash grants as a way of saying thanks to Minnesota troops started back in 2005 and since then has provided more than 12,000 grants totaling nearly 7.5 million 
to Minnesota service members and the families of those killed in action. Those are some pretty good numbers. <laughs> Family is the main reason why many of us in this room tonight respect and admire our service men and women so deeply because without them, without their commitment and sacrifice to our country's foundation, we may not enjoy the privileges afforded to us. And that's why we've all come together here tonight to say thanks to all of them. And thank you for being here to do just that. And now while you enjoy the salads, there are some special guests I'd like to introduce our three speakers this evening. High school student, Kiona Kaylili, whose father, Bruce, is deployed overseas right now. Three-time Purple Heart recipient and Bloomington, Minnesota native, Corporal John Elliott. And tonight's keynote speaker, an American hero whose actions on the battlefield in Vietnam earned him three bronze stars, two silver stars, and the Medal of Honor, the highest U.S. military decoration, Colonel Jack Jacobs. Thank you so much to all of you for your sacrifices. And next, I would be very remiss if I didn't mention Gail and Roger Sitt, MMAF's founder, Eugene Sitt's wife and son. Gail remains MMAF's largest and most active benefactor, following the tradition of her late husband established in 2005. Roger succeeded his father as the leader of Sitt Investment Associates and chair of MMAF and has been instrumental in realizing his father's vision for the organization. Thank you, Roger. And finally tonight, I'd like to remember Ken Dahlberg, who we recently lost. Ken was a World War II veteran who served as a member of the US Army Air Corps. He was also a triple ace. That means he shot down 15 enemy planes. And he was a POW after being shot down a third time himself. In addition to serving our country, Ken also served MMAF tirelessly and honorably since it began back in 2005. And Ken knew how important it was to say thanks. So tonight, I'd like us to say thanks to Ken by observing a moment of silence in his memory. Thank you, Ken, and thanks, everybody. Finally, I'd like to pay tribute to a fallen Minnesota service member, U.S. Navy Special Officer Second Class Nicholas Spihar of Chisago City. He was a member of the Navy SEAL Team 5 who joined the Navy in 2007 upon returning from deployment to Yemen as part of Operation Enduring Freedom. He bravely volunteered to be deployed to Afghanistan. On August 6, 2011, Special Officer Second Class Spihar was tragically killed in action, along with 29 other Americans, including 22 Navy SEALs when their Chinook helicopter was hit by insurgent fire. And joining us tonight are his mother, Annette, sisters Marie and Lisa, and other close family members. Let's take a moment to remember Special Officer Second Class Bihar, his life and his honor of sacrifice in defense of the United States with another moment of silence. And we so thank the Bihar family for your sacrifices. Now, if you would please stand along with me as the Minnesota National Honor Guard presents our colors tonight. 
And the national anthem will also be sung by Sergeant Brian Hitchcock, a member of the Red Bull Band. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rockets ran glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you, Red Bull Band, for that moving tribute to the United States of America and all our service members in attendance tonight. And it's okay to clap for that, yeah. We are, in fact, very honored uh, to be in the presence of so many past and present service members tonight. In fact, if you look at your table, uh, you'll find MREs, Meals Ready to Eat. Standard fare for our deployed military personnel serving in combat zones. It's uh, just a symbol of the large sacrifices they make for us. Roger, can everybody sit down? Yeah, let's all sit. <laughs> I do hope that you will pass the MRE around, uh, sample the food, and think about our troops tonight while you're eating uh, an MRE dinner, that is, in a uh, far away land. A good way to be thinking about them. And as we do think about those so far away from us tonight, we remember those who did not make it home. Our fallen cannot be forgotten. And there's also, of course, the POWs and MIAs. So if you would please do me a favor and now direct your attention to our empty table that represents the missing soldier. Each item is significant. The single red rose reminds us of the families who keep safe waiting for their return. The candle that's lit represents their unconquerable spirit. The slice of lemon on the plate represents their bitter fate. And the glass inverted represents they're not here to toast with us tonight. Throughout the evening, I encourage you to take a moment to read the small paper bands that are wrapped around your napkins, if you haven't already. Each paper band contains notes from Minnesota soldiers or their families thanking MMAF and thanking you for your support. Though MMAF is a non-governmental organization, Minnesota's leaders in Congress and at the state capitol, including Governor Mark Dayton, have been vocal supporters of MMAF and its mission of saying thanks to Minnesota troops. Although you couldn't be with us tonight, 
Governor Dayton does have a special welcome message for our attendees and honorees. I'd like to read it to you. It says, Dear friends, on behalf of the state of Minnesota, welcome to the 2011 Minnesotans Military Appreciation Fund dinner. The Minnesotans Military Appreciation Fund's commitment to our servicemen and women and their families is truly inspiring. It is clear that the success of the MMAF is based on a shared understanding that we must give back to those who dedicate their lives to the safety and peace of our state and our world. Like you, I am committed to the well-being of our veterans and the many Minnesota service men and women currently serving in Iraq, Afghanistan, and all around the world. The men and women of our armed forces deserve our deepest gratitude for the courageous sacrifices they make on our behalf. We also must recognize the families, friends, and neighbors who provide our returning soldiers with unwavering support. Once again, on the behalf of state, the state of Minnesota, thank you for your commitment to our service members. I wish the Minnesotans Military Appreciation Fund continued growth and success. My best regards, sincerely, Mark Dayton, Governor of Minnesota. And now I'd like to introduce U.S. Army National Guard Chaplain Lieutenant Colonel John Morris, who will offer an invocation for the evening. Lieutenant Colonel Morris has served as an Army Chaplain for more than 25 years, most recently serving three tours of duty in Iraq. Ladies and gentlemen, will you bow with me as we ask God's blessing on our evening and on our warriors who are far forward on our behalf tonight. Gracious and almighty God, thank you for the freedom that enables us to be here this evening. Thank you for the generosity of the Sit family and for the great citizens of Minnesota who've contributed to this cause and to the compassionate hearts that have understood the sacrifice of military families, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and members of our Coast Guard. I ask your blessing on this organization, this evening in our fellowship, and on our great nation. Heavenly Father, guide our president, those who advise him, our com combat commanders, the men and women with rifles fighting on our behalf in Afghanistan, Iraq, the Horn of Africa, under the sea, on the sea, in the air, and be with their families. Comfort them during the long days of separation and bring their loved one home safely. Assuage the sorrow of those who've lost our heroes and heal the wounds of our wounded warriors. We ask all of this with humbleness and gratefulness for the privilege of being Americans. Please bless our country. Amen. Thanks so much, Lieutenant Colonel Morris, for the invocation tonight. As many of you know, the past decade has been a trying time for the United States as we struggle with our economic issues at home and uh, lengthy overseas military deployments abroad. Our military families often bear the brunt of both of those burdens, working hard to make ends meet on the home front while praying for their loved ones' safe return from combat. I'd like to take a moment to share with you some of the human faces of the mission, the men, women, and children MMAF has thanked with cash grants. The tradition of welcoming soldiers returning home from the battlefield dates back generations, even centuries. There have also been times when the soldier hasn't heard thanks. Fortunately, we have learned from those times. The Minnesotans Military Appreciation Fund has embraced the tradition of honoring soldiers. MMAF was launched in August 2005, based on the vision of founder, Gene Sitt. The mission was simple. Say thanks and award a cash grant to every Minnesotan who has served in a combat zone since September 11, 2001. With his great passion and energy, Gene Sitt recruited leaders and supporters from across Minnesota. Gene and Gail Sitt donated the first million dollars. 
Over the next four months, MMAF raised public awareness at the State Fair, held the first Troop Appreciation Walk in downtown Minneapolis, and fundraising dinner with Senator John McCain as keynote speaker. Young men and women will learn courage from your good character. They will learn from your love for something greater than yourself. By the end of 2005, the first 1,000 checks were in the mail as funds distributed approached half a million dollars. Tonight, Sergeant Marquis and Sergeant Adam Sands were honored by the Minnesota Timberwolves. In 2006, public support grew as MMAF honored troops on the Timberwolves court and the Twins field. And soldier stories were being heard. I was wondering kind of how I was going to make my house payment. With my disabilities that limit my mobility, it, it's been really tough to, to um, get back into the swing of things. So, so this is just a huge weight off my shoulders, and I really appreciate what these guys are doing. It's just amazing. By the end of 2006, over $1.5 million had been distributed and over 4,000 grants. In 2007, MMAF hosted the second fundraising dinner with keynote speaker Thomas Friedman. I came here for one reason to express my thanks to those who don't really ever get to decide the wisdom of a war, don't really get to determine its execution, don't really get to debate its virtues, but who, when the orders come, willingly answer the call. That year, the general grant rose from $250 to $500, thanks to successful fundraising by so many people. By the end of 2007, over 4 million had been distributed and over 6,500 grants. What an incredible group of courageous individuals. I'm not alone when I say I think that you are everyone's heroes. Well, I've been in for 14 years now. I joined in 1996. This was actually my second deployment. You just think you're doing your job. You think you're doing what any other person would do. So it's, it's weird when people say thank you and you get the capital to get a, an award. I didn't think it was all a big deal. I'm happy I got a chance to serve. By the end of 2008, 8,000 grants have been distributed with over $5 million awarded. MMAF continues to grow with the dedication of each of MMAF's donors. It is a shared success. I'm very proud of my Minnesota heritage, but community efforts like Minnesota Military Appreciation Fund make me doubly proud. In 2009, nearly 9,000 awards have been distributed, approaching $6 million. You know, I served for a little under three years, was wounded in Iraq, and that led to a medical discharge. I ran into a buddy who uh, told me about the MMAF. Not only financially did it help, but they've led to doing a lot of cool things. Just last week, we got to raise the flag at the Twin Stadium, which was a pretty exhilarating experience when uh, 30,000 people are cheering your name after they hear you got a Purple Heart. In the effort to say thank you, people come together from all across the state, from the annual walk to the fundraising dinner. As I look across these tables, it would be very hard for me to determine who may be a member of the Tea Party, or a Democrat, or a Republican, or an Independent. You come here out of a common cause of honoring the warriors and their families who represent all of us. Each donation has made MMAF the largest organization of its kind in the country, with approximately 90% of donations paid out directly to grant recipients. It's almost like you're in a time warp. You get home, I didn't really know um, what I was going to be doing. Um, I was going to school before we, we were deployed. Tons of different things. Where am I going to stay? Where am I going to live? I ended up going to school at Metro State. I was going to have to put the, the, that semester on a credit card and uh, the grant came, it was like perfect timing. I ended up getting it and able to pay off that whole, that whole first semester. Minnesota has you know, a lot of great um, individuals and a lot of great corporations and organizations that have donated um, these things for soldiers. You know, when all the, all the hype, everyone's around, it's, it's easy to, 
to get on board, um, but they've kept it going. Yes, MMAF has kept it going. In 2011, over 12,000 grants have been distributed to our service members. Troops are still being deployed in great numbers. Continued support of MMAF remains vital, as our mission of thanks will only be complete when their mission is complete. That was very well produced. To talk to those TV folks that you have going on there, Roger. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, the cover of Time Magazine right now, um, but it talks all about our veterans and uh, some of their struggles that they deal with um, upon coming back home. The number of deployments and then that transition back into civilian life. Uh, I read a little bit of what one of the Marine sergeants uh, who was quoted in here said. He said, you know what, it was like my war was seen as sort of a bizarre camping trip uh, that nobody else went on. And um, I thought that was very interesting. It's very hard if you've not served to know what our men and women are going through over there. And um, there was another person in this room who was quoted in that article, Jack Jacobs. He says, we love the troops. And you know why we love the troops? Because we don't have to be the troops. And it's something to think about tonight as we are thanking our men and women. Another thing to think about quickly, I know you're all very aware of some of these issues that we talked about moments ago economically. Our unemployment rate in this country, 9%. Our unemployment rate among veterans in this country, 12.1%. Our unemployment among veterans in the state of Minnesota, double that, the third highest in the country. So I encourage all of you in the business community as well to consider a veteran for your, may, your next job opening that you may have. Pretty incredible candidate pool. Again, we want to thank you all for being here tonight. MMAF has awarded, as you saw, more than 12,000 grants to Minnesota service members and their families, just like the ones featured in the video. If you are moved to continue your support tonight or you're thinking about giving to MMAF for the very first time, there are donation envelopes at each one of the tables for your convenience. Every dollar does go directly to Minnesota troops and their families. And now it's an honor for me to introduce MMAF Chair and CEO of SIT Investment Associates, founding sponsor of MMAF. Many of you know that Roger's father, Eugene SIT, was the guiding force behind creating MMAF and leading that organization until his passing in 2008. Roger does continue his father's great vision for MMAF Prior to his two decades in finance at private institutions, Roger was a captain in the United States Air Force, serving six years active duty with financial management responsibilities at Headquarters Space Division. Roger graduated with military distinction from the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, 1984. Was I supposed to say 84? <laughs> Please welcome Roger Sid. Thank you, Heidi. I would also like to welcome everyone here tonight and thank you for all your support. My father would have loved seeing tonight's patriotic displays, but I think the part he would have loved most is the commitment and generosity that this room has provided to our military service members. Tonight, we honor heroes serving our nation we thank, we thank all our military for their tireless service and for the sacrifices they and their families are making. All that they endure, the hours away from home and their families and friends, the stress, the risk, and the unknown is incalculable. The cash grants that MMAF awards to our service members and their families are modest in comparison to what they're doing for us. But we want to make sure they know that we recognize and appreciate what they're doing for our country. And every time we issue a grant, we hear the same thing. It just simply feels good to be thanked. We all enjoy the gift of freedom and democracy in the United States of America. 
and we know that freedom is not free. So at this time, I would like to thank all our service members and their families for their efforts. Thank you. I also would like to thank everyone who supported MMAF in the past, as well as who are supporting us tonight. We thank our individual donors, our corporate sponsors, and all the organizations that raise money on our behalf. We truly have a grassroots effort, as you can see on the video, for, from all corners of Minnesota. And that's what makes our organization special. It's not just one individual, it's not just one corporation, it's the whole state getting behind and thanking our military members and, and their families. Without your work and support, we would not be able to accomplish our mission. We've, as you can see, we've accomplished a great deal already. However, the fundraising effort continues because our troops continue to be sent abroad. While there are a number of active duty members that are starting to return home, there are a lot of guard and reserve that are replacing them and that are being sent overseas. Rest assured, as these men and women continue to serve honorably, MMAF will not stop raising funds until we complete our mission of thanks. As a nonprofit, nonpolitical group, we are united in our appreciation of our military and our, our, the service members' families, and we continue raising grant funds until the last service member comes home. We know fundraising is not an easy task, and we greatly appreciate all the work that you've all done for us. Thanks again for coming and supporting us tonight, and enjoy the evening. Won't offend me in the least if you want to finish your dessert, uh, but in the interest of keeping the program on, you know, on schedule, I thought we would get started. Um, Heidi had to leave, as you, you might suspect, to get to her newscast this evening, so that puts me in a very significant disadvantage because uh, she's a pretty difficult act to follow. Uh, so I'll see what I can do. Um, as a former Army officer and a Vietnam veteran, it's a real privilege for me, more than I think most folks uh, tonight, to introduce our next three speakers. And although we frequently talk a lot about our men and women who are deployed overseas, it's their children who office make, often make the greatest sacrifices. I'm proud to introduce a, an extraordinary young woman. Her name is Kiana Kelii, whose father is a member of the Minnesota National Guard. Believe it or not, he's serving his third deployment overseas in just eight years. Kiana is a founding member of the Minnesota Military Teen Panel. She shares her experiences with other teens in education, social science, and psychology professionals, professionals rather, who are struggling with appropriate methods to help teens cope with a parent's overseas deployment. She's been recognized as a leading national voice for teens and military families, speaking to school groups and the news media while balancing school, driver's education, and just the general rigors of being a teenager. Please welcome Kiana Kelii. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk about being a teenager in the military family. I have quite a lot of experience with the Army. I'm in my third deployment with my dad being gone nine months to a year. My dad has completed several training camps that took him away for two to three months. I've moved seven times in eight years. We've been in our house now for seven years. It feels strange being in a house that long. I've loved to move to the Army base in Italy, but we won't. My dad is not active duty. He is part of the Minnesota Army National Guard. My dad's first deployment was when I was in second grade. I'm not sure if many of you can remember things from second grade, but I don't recall much from it. Uh, my mom says it's all a blur for her too. What I do remember is picking him up at the armory, or the drive back, and my mom was driving since he hadn't driven in almost a year. We came to an intersection and saw that the van had crashed and was on its side in a ditch. My dad made my mom stop, and I remember him running down the road in his uniform. 
I was only eight and didn't really know what was going on. I kept asking what had happened to my mom, but she wouldn't give me an answer. I could see people standing on the side of the road, and there's my dad climbing in the back door of the van. He helped get a couple teenagers and the mom out of the van and then came back to us. We could see the ambulance coming, but he didn't want to stick around. He just wanted to get home. He didn't want to tell people that he had just got back to see his family after nine months. He didn't want to stick around, and so we left. I wanted everyone to know what a hero he is and say, hey, my dad just saved you. It was just another day for him, but for me it was like seeing my dad as a superhero. Our second deployment was when I was in seventh grade. That was a really hard one. I had trouble concentrating in school and was taken out of honors classes for not having good enough grades. The teachers really didn't seem to care. My mom came to talk to the teacher, but they said she should have been checking my grades the whole time. Very few of my friends understood what I was going through. How do you tell someone that the show you just watched made you worry that your dad would be hit by a missile? Or when school shows a movie about 9-11, it makes you think your parent is going to die. And worrying keeps you up at night, and that's why you're so tired. Kids don't comprehend that. They would laugh and call you crazy, and that's when you stop opening up to others. Now I'm in 10th grade, and it's our third deployment, and it feels like my dad was here only for a few months before being taken away again. I think high school is a bit more understanding. My mom has also talked to the superintendent, principal, PTA, and my teachers. I have different friends that are very supportive. I think they know more about what's going on with the war. I know I have a better view on what's going on and why I feel certain things. I also know more teens who have parents or siblings in the military, and I can vent to them. So that leads me to the story of the Minnesota Military Teen Panel. Back when my dad was in Iraq, we went to a family event at the convention center. There were lots of things for the little kids to do, but not for teens. So the instructors grabbed me and a friend and told us to make puppets and put on a puppet show for the children. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. I have to make a puppet. So both me and my friend texted our parents and we said, get us out of here. They're insane. We don't want to do this. So after it was over, I told her I would never go to another one of those events again. Well, shortly after that, we saw that Operation Military Kids was forming a teen panel. I really wanted to make a change and help other teens not suffer through puppet shows. <laughs> Since that started over a year ago, we have helped with teen-specific activities at different events and had our own teen retreat. This summer, I was able to go to Louisville, Kentucky to the National Youth Symposium. I met other military teens from Oregon to Massachusetts, Hawaii to the Virgin Islands. It was amazing. I'm really glad I had that opportunity. The trip was over four months ago, and I still keep in contact with many of the teens. My dad has missed a lot of things while being gone. He's been deployed or in training for more than three years of my life. But we try to stay connected. My dad loves hockey, to play it, watch it, and coach it. When he was in Iraq, he asked my mom to see if the ice rink had Wi-Fi so he could watch some of my tournament games through Skype. It did, and so no matter what time a game was here in the US, if he could watch me or my brother, he would get up to watch us. My teammates loved to see him on the computer and say hi. My mom felt as if she was carrying a magical head. This past spring, our lacrosse team went to the state championship, and he wasn't there. There was no Wi-Fi at the field, so he couldn't see it. In Kuwait, the internet can't carry the video for Skype, so he wasn't able to see when I was chosen for homecoming court this past fall, or when my brother scored the first goal of the season at his PWA hockey game. While he's gone, I lose a driver, or a chauffeur, as I like to say, a cook, a housekeeper, and a mentor. It's hard adapting to live with one parent and then adjusting back to two. It's difficult to remember all that's happened in one week and then tell him in a phone call, maybe that I get once a week. It's so much easier having a casual conversation in the car or around the dinner table, but if I could text him, he'd be all up to date. Because of MMAF, my dad has been able to receive two grants after his deployments. It's the generosity of Minnesotans that help MMAF give these grants to families. Thank you for your support. Thank you very much, Kiana. Now I have two tough acts to follow. <laughs> On behalf of everyone in MMAF, as well as everyone in this room, I want you to know, Kiana, that your exceptional work that you're doing with what exceptional work you're doing with these military families. You're the heart and soul of the home front, as well as wise and brave, obviously, beyond, beyond your years. 
Our next speaker is one of Minnesota's own heroes. He is a three-time Purple Heart recipient whose gallant actions in Iraq exemplify the tenacity of American soldiers today. He's Corporate John Elliott. John enlisted in the Army shortly after graduating from high school, and in just one year, John survived seven explosions and was shot twice. John Elliott was an MMAF grant recipient of $14,000 last year. Uh, tonight, he's going to reflect on his experiences both in the combat zone and returning home. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce a real hero to you, Corporal John Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Winslow, and a special thanks uh, to Kiana for all she's doing to help young people and military families here in Minnesota. I also want to recognize all of my fellow veterans in this room and across the state of Minnesota. Those of you who have served in combat know the story that I'm about to share, which some call heroic, is all too common in warfare. This is a part of the job that we've agreed to do on behalf of the American people. On March 29th in 2008, during the surge in Iraq, I was engaging in a firefight of my life and the life of my comrades in Sadr City. We were under heavy fire from all directions after moving into the city. After about 15 hours of sustained fire, we realized that we had to rest and refit, collapse our soldiers back into the vehicle, and uh, meet on the outside of the city to go back to the ammo pile to get more ammo. By this time, by this time Sorry, my track was already hit with two IEDs. Luckily, they were just little poppers. They try and uh, throw your track off your vehicle, which means, so the actual Bradley has track that goes on it, and the little IEDs are invented just to throw that off to then give you a dead vehicle so you can't move around, therefore a much more vulnerable target. Even though my driver was actually injured in uh, one of the IEDs that we hit, he still pushed forward and moved us into the city, only to realize that we were in the middle of a minefield of IEDs, so we had to cease movement forward and actually wait uh, to go back and get route clearance. So upon this new information, we packed all of our dismounts up, got to the outside of the city and lined up behind eight Abram tanks, which are the big heavy-duty boys that get the job done. When we were behind the tanks, they actually left without us knowing. Um, we were on different comm frequencies. It was a quick mission that was set up very uh, kind of on the fly. And so we didn't have much time to make sure that we could all talk to each other. It sounds kind of foolish, but at this point, we were getting heavy fire from the Mahdi militia, and they were attacking the green zone. So time was obviously urgent, and we just had to continue the mission forward. The Abrams actually took off without, without us knowing it. Um, they drove away. Uh, we, they didn't let us know anything, obviously, on comms. They didn't give us any visual warning saying, hey, we're taking off. Uh, they just drove out. And if you know anything about tanks, they are much more faster than Bradley. So even if, even if I wanted to, there was no way we were going to catch them. Um, I did notice, though, by this time, night had fallen. So after about 15 hours of sustained fire, as I was saying, uh, night had fallen, and we were actually spotlit under a light in the uh, middle of Sadr City. I asked my Bradley commander that we'd move forward because we were such an obvious target for indirect fire. If you can't see the vehicle, you can't dial in a coordinates, therefore you can't make a kill. Um, no more, as soon as I asked that we move forward, we move forward and we were hit with two EFPs, explosively formed projectiles there. Copper, um, essentially big copper projectiles that can melt right through any up armor, any, they've, they've proven to be very effective, we should say, for the enemy in uh, Iraq. One went through the troop compartment, and the other one went through the turret. I was instantly knocked out, and then only regained consciousness by the furnace that my vehicle had turned into. Um, my bulletproof vest and my actual ACU top was actually started to melt to my skin, so I had to pull that off and just rip everything off because I, I didn't know if I was on fire or not. I reached for my weapon only to realize it was melted in two. Um, there was no one else in the turret with me. It was all smoky and I couldn't see. So my next plan of action was to find my way up and out of the hatch and uh, try and get to safety. 
As soon as I got up and out of the vehicle, I realized that the firefight that we had just, just recently been involved with had followed us outside of the city and we are now being ambushed by three to 400 Mahdi militia. As soon as we got on the ground, I realized that I was, not on, one, I was not the only casualty, but out of the seven people in the Bradley, five were injured. Out of the five people that were injured, one of them actually severed his femoral artery. So he was losing blood fast. We were able to get a tourniquet on him, but we knew we had to make the movement. Out of the seven, I said again, five were injured. So um, time was urgent, and we had to make sure we got out of there before we suffered any more casualties. The only choice we had was to bound forward 300 meters under heavy fire to the next Bradley to get some sort of cover. The Bradley in front of us actually had a broken ramp by the time we got there. So we bounded forward. We had only one weapon that survived the explosion. And then we had one magazine and a bulletproof vest that we had thrown up and we were running with it to protect our flank while we had a gun on the other flank and then the Bradleys were giving us assistance to our front and to our six. Um, when we got to the Bradleys, I said before, the ramp was jammed, so they couldn't actually let us inside. So we have five soldiers, all messed up, waiting to get inside this Bradley, and it just wasn't going to happen. Um, what they were able to offer us was still good, moving support. So as the Bradley was driving forward, we were walking next to it, kind of as it's, it's getting our, our flank side, and then we were only taking fire from one side. In the process of doing this, I took two ricochets to the back of my leg from AK-47 rounds on top of the burns that we had already uh, received from the prior explosion of the EFPs. As we were moving back to our Bradley, or back to the evac vehicle, I should say, which was now about another 100 meters past our Bradley, so we had to go up, turn around, and go exactly back where we came from. So all together, we probably moved a good 1,200 meters. Once we got about 150 meters away from the evac vehicle, we heard the sound of hissing engines, which if any of you know anything about Abrams, they sound exactly like a Black Hawk helicopter. They, they scream. And we had no idea where they were coming from. So we halted our movement to make sure we didn't get crushed. Obviously, the situation was a little hectic, so we just made sure that we kept our casualties down. As soon as I looked up, we seen Abrams come over the top of the wall, and then it was like beauty. There was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And it's, uh, being on the ground under heavy fire, 400 people, and you're the only guy, we have one weapon. It, that, was the greatest thing I think I've ever saw in my entire life was these Abrams coming back to help us out. No sooner did they come over the wall that they actually studied their barrel on the enemy and started to engage. If you've ever heard the sound of a 120 millimeter gun go off, you know that if you're too close, you're gonna lose your hearing. I lost the hearing in my right ear, so we actually had to use hand signals to get back to the evac vehicle itself. We're all running off of pure adre adrenaline. Once we were able to get back to the evac vehicle, all that adrenaline wore off and shock started to set in. We all started having trouble breathing and having trouble actually staying conscious. And what's funny is the last thing I remember about Iraq was taking one step off the back of the MRAP, which is a, it's a glorified, I don't know, a glorified troop carrier with wheels. Um, I stepped, I went black, I didn't see anything. I woke up in Landstuhl, Germany at a U.S. Army hospital where I was being treated for my burns and my gunshot wounds. Three days later, we were moved to San Antonio, Texas's Brook Army Medical Center, which specializes in, it has a burn unit there that's very, that's very, very good. I was a part of the CFI for about a year and a half, Center for the Intrepid, where I went through my rehabilitation, learning how to walk again, learning how to just obviously be a, a proper member of society. And as soon as I got the okay from my doctors, I was discharged from the Army and got to come back to this beautiful state here in Minnesota. It's probably no surprise to you that I feel exceptionally grateful to be addressing you here tonight. But the theme of tonight, saying thanks, is so important for morale. As a grant recipient myself, I am thankful for the financial assistance, but I feel MMAF does such a huge difference in the lives of our Minnesota troops and their families beyond just sending a check. In many ways, being a soldier is a job like any other. And just like any other job, it feels good when someone recognizes the work you are doing. Bottom line, it feels good to be thanked by the citizens you're serving. And I'm honored to share my story so that others may feel thankful and 
that others will feel the thankfulness and the gratitude that I feel tonight. Thank you. You know what, let's give one more round of applause to Kiana and John. Well, I'm honored, very honored, to introduce our keynote speaker, Colonel Jack Jacobs. In our society, I think the term war hero is, you know, is often used, but if, but, but if anyone is worthy of that title, it's Colonel Jacobs. And there's a lot to say about him. Uh, I will say, though, that uh, having gotten to know him today a little bit, to show you the kind of guy he is, I said, well, what would you like me to say or not say this evening? He said, oh, you don't have to say all that other stuff. He said, you just need to tell everybody that my father was an engineering student at the University of Minnesota in 1941, 42, and 43. Is that right, Jack? Right. <laughs> um, but I, now I'm going to say all the other stuff he didn't want me to say. Um, Jack obviously had an exemplary career in the Army. It included two tours in Vietnam and three years on the faculty at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Jack retired from the Army as a, as a full colonel and had many successes in, in the business world. And he's continued to teach at West Point. He currently holds an endowed chair. It's the, the McDermott Chair of Political Science at, at West Point. He's also a military analyst for NBC and MSNBC. Well, that would be, all those accomplishments would be a lot for anyone. But in addition to all that, he is a genuine American hero. He's one of only 3,500 Americans since the Civil War to be awarded the Medal of Honor for conspicuous gallantry above and beyond the call of duty while engaged in action against the enemies of the United States. And uh, I think that when you talk about Medal of Honor winners, everybody always say, well, what happened? Uh, Jack has probably heard this many, many times before, but I think everybody is interested in what happened. Jack was an advisor to a Vietnamese infantry battalion when it came under fire on March 9, 1968. I would remind all of, all of you that 1968, March 9th, was right after the Tet Offensive began, about 30 days after Tet began. With his commanding officer disabled and wounded, and despite a severe head wound, then First Lieutenant Jacobs took command. He withdrew the unit to safety and returned again to the battlefield, and he performed life-saving first aid. He saved the lives of the, of the other U.S. advisor and 13 Allied soldiers. For this gallantry, President Richard Nixon awarded Jack the Medal of Honor in a White House ceremony on October 9, 1969. Jack tells his story of heroism, honor, and the nature of sacrifice in his book, If Not Now, When? Ladies and gentlemen, I couldn't be more privileged to introduce you to Colonel Jack Jacobs. Get some water there if you need it. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the. Uh, warm introduction and the applause. I'm reminded of the Seinfeld observation to, to uh, George Costanza that when you hear applause, say thank you very much and leave because it's not going to get any better. That's it. Well, I, can you see me at all from where you are? I apologize for this very opaque and tall uh, podium. Because it seems like I'm probably, you can't see me at all. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a great thing being a very short person. Uh, when, I, when I first came into the Army, people said, don't go into the Army. can't go into the Army because it's for big, strong people. You have to be able to bench press a Buick or something like that. And so little Weasley people like you have no business in the military service. And then when all the bullets and shrapnel start flying around, everybody starts to get to try to, get, try to get to be about this big. I do not understand how normally sized human beings manage to survive. And if I were two inches taller, I'd be dead. So I really like being a very small person. 
John Elliott and I see eye to eye, and he's very, he's a, you're a lucky guy to be as little as you are. Um, I've got a very digressive mind. It reminds me of a short story, and so as long as we're talking about, uh, about television and so on, I'll tell you this story very quickly. Uh, this was during the war, and I spent a lot of time, we were going to take Baghdad, and I spent a lot of time on television. Uh, we were on 24 hours a day on MSNBC and NBC talking about what was going on in the field, and I had a, a cell phone. I could actually talk to some of the guys I knew who were down in the field, and I get all this information. Uh, in the breaks, and then we'd come back from the break, and I'd, I'd talk about what was going on. We had a huge sand table and so on. And the guy who I spent the most am amount of time with uh, was Lester Holt. Lester is, a, is an Air Force brat, and now he does Dateline and does night, uh, weekend nightly news and you know, weekend today and so on. He's an Air Force brat. He's also a big, tall guy. He's six foot four inches tall. And I am not six feet four inches tall. As a matter of fact, I had a, you have to be five, you have to be five feet four inches tall to get a commission in the Army. I had to request a waiver so that would waive my height. Otherwise, I couldn't get a commission. So I'm on the air talking about what's going on. And we go to a break. And then the general manager of MSNBC comes out and says, this is not working at all. It's not, not good. So what are you talking about? He said, well, we can't, we can't get you and Lester in the same thing, same frame. He said, when we zoom in, when you're talking, we zoom in to see you, we can't see Lester. And when we zoom back so we can see Lester, it, he looks like a ventriloquist. There's, you know, there's this voice coming out of nowhere, and it's you, but nobody can see. This is not good television. So what we're going to, you know, television is an intensely visual medium, and it, it's all, it's not what you hear, it's what you see in the end, and so on. And he says, you're going to have to stand on a box. Stand on a box, okay, I'll stand on a box, whatever. So they actually get a box, stagehands bring a box up, and I stand on a box, and then we come back from the break, and here we're carrying on again. 101st Airborne Division's here, and this is what's happening, all the rest of that stuff. This, the general manager didn't bother to change the rundown or go back and tell the control room, the executive or senior producer, that I was standing on a box. Because at the end of the next eight minutes or so, and then we're going to go to a new commercial, they had what is called a bump shot, where they cut the audio to me and Lester and pulled the camera back to reveal my standing on a box. And then my cell phone is ringing off the hook with people who used to be friends of mine, <laughs> leaving me messages saying, holy cow, you're standing on the box. <laughs> and the worst from an old buddy of mine, Tommy O'Grady, who was one of only 200 Marines drafted into the war in Vietnam, fought at Quezon, calling from some saloon in Jupiter, Florida, <laughs> leaving a message, do you know you're standing on a box? <laughs> This actually happened. Anyway, it's very good being a short person. And, and when, I, uh, when I retired, I discovered that being a, a very small person is still good. Uh, you were very concerned about being green and using up too many resources. I don't use up too many resources. I have a very small carbon footprint. I can wear children's clothes. I get some dandruff on them, I throw them away. And so, on. so it's nice being short. I came into the Army uh, for a couple of reasons. The first is that I, uh, I thought then, and I still think today, that everybody who's lucky enough uh, to live in a free country owes it something in the way of service. Are you looking at somebody who believes in universal service? Uh, not selective service, not you can come in, but you don't have to, and so on. I think we all owe some sort of debt to the country that gives us an opportunity to be free. And if we don't do that, if we don't do that, I think uh, over the long term, we're going to be very, very unhappy that we did not do that. And I did say, and it was quoted in Time Magazine this week, that I said that uh, we love the troops because most people, because they don't have to be the troops. It's very easy to love people like that who are doing the heavy lifting and outside work when you don't have to do it. 
Um, my father had served in the South Pacific in the Second World War. He dragged unceremoniously from the University of Minnesota with like about two minutes left to go and uh, went and fought in New Guinea and the Philippines. And everybody in my neighborhood where I grew up uh, had served. Every, every household had had somebody uh, serving from that house, sometimes more than one serving in the military. The second reason I joined the military through ROTC is because ROTC paid you $27 a month. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot of money now, and it wasn't even a lot of money then, but I, I was desperately in need of the money at the time. Uh, I had uh, done something extremely stupid and required. I got married when I was 18 years old. Do not do that. I mean, for most of you, it's much too late. Uh, it's a, in any case, well, I, was, I mean, I've got all these lovely children and grandchildren loving or running around and, and so on. But, uh, but 18 years, you shouldn't, anybody here is not married? Raise your hand if you're not married. Excellent. Stay that way is my advice to you, young children. I think when my kids were growing up, I have a very digressive mind, and I apologize. I'm only supposed to be, speak for about five minutes, but I'll, when, when my children were growing up, I told them that they should not get married, and if they intended to get married, they should wait until the proper age to get married. And that age is 85. That's the right age to get married. Do not settle for anything less. Well, they didn't listen to me in any case. So I needed the money desperately. Later on, when I was commissioned, I, my first assignment was in the 82nd Airborne Division. And I went airborne for the same reason I, I went through ROTC. They paid you extra money. I made $222.10 a month. And you don't have to have a degree in accounting to realize if they're going to pay an extra $110 a month, that's a 50% increase in salary. And all you had to do was jump out of airplanes. And those of you who are airborne know that there's nothing to it. If you have a good body position and all that stuff, they're basically paying you every single month to prove every single month that gravity exists. <laughs> because if gravity does all the work, you don't have to do anything. Which I thought was, uh, you know, another example of what happens when large bureaucracies get in charge of the, of the checkbook, among other things. Here they are paying me continuously you know, as if gravity was going to stop working in March, and in April we had to prove it again. My first company commander was a guy named Hunter Shotwell. Now, I guess if your name is Shotwell, you name your kid or Ammo or <laughs> Front Sight or, you know, Buttstock or something like that, or Hunter. Hunter Shotwell was a 1963 graduate of West Point. And uh, he was later, to, he had been in Vietnam, he was later to go back to Vietnam and a mortar round got in a bunker with him and killed him. But in 1966, he was my company commander. And after a short, suitable amount of time in his office, after I reported to him, he said, well, now get out of here. And I said, but sir, which platoon is mine? For those of you who don't know, an infantry company's got four platoons of about 40 men each. He said, which platoon is yours? You must be joking. They're, we're the only officers in this company. They are all yours. And I went instantly from being responsible for absolutely positively nothing to being responsible for absolutely everything in the lives of about 160 men. There is nothing like military service that gives young people authority and responsibility at an early age. And years later, when I retired from the Army, I, I left, I was at the National War College and went to Wall Street, I got calls from people who were still students at the National War College asking me how was it out there, as if I were on parole. So, and they were coming up for a work release hearing. I said, it's perfectly OK. Everybody outside who is successful either has military experience or is innately of a military mind. All the things that you learn when you're a young soldier, sailor, or airman, or marine, those are all the things you need to know in order to be a success in civilian life. And indeed, one of the things that's really annoying about the current situation, aside from the, the state of the economy and, the, and the, uh, the asymmetrical adverse impact it has on, on military people and former military people, is the fact that the American public does not recognize the genuine talent, not the value or the worth of our troops, but the genuine talent of our troops, 
who have had authority and responsibility way out of proportion to their years, who know the difference between authority and responsibility, who know that these two things need never, should never be separated, who've had authority and responsibility over a large number of people over a long period of time in difficult circumstances with few resources having to accomplish important missions, which by the way, that, those are things that a lot of CEOs have never had the opportunity to do, and to the extent that they have had them have failed in doing it. And yet we have 19, 20, 25, 30-year-old kids with military experience who can fall into a job tomorrow and do it. And yet we don't do a good enough job of promulgating the notion that people with military experience are the, not that we, not that we owe them a job, they're the best we can produce. They're absolutely outstanding people and we're making a big mistake. The United States of America is making a big mistake when it doesn't recognize the talent of its dedicated young people who put themselves on the line in order to defend the republic and defend the, ref the freedom of other people. And there are lots and lots of other things that kids learn in the military that people on the outside never learn, like trying to figure out what the objective is before you start allocating resources. We do that all the time in government, in business, and yet people in the military know that you're not supposed to do that. Finding the objective before you try to allocate resources. We know that in the military. Uh, people on the outside, particularly in government, don't know to do that. I've got one word about resources uh, before I close. Because uh, we're in an er era of constrained resources, have been for some time, and will be for some time to come, quite frankly. Uh, it's going to be a while before we get back on our feet again, and it's going to take a great deal of, uh, of leadership and political will to get there, but we will get there. But resources being as... Uh, as scarce as they are and becoming scarcer as time goes on. Uh, it's important that we recognize how important resources are and how we can't survive unless we recognize that we have to plan for the future before we start allocating resources willy-nilly. Uh, most of you are business people and you know that most businesses fail in the first year. Why not enough resources? Jacob's first rule of uh, resources is that it always takes more resources to hold on to an objective than it does to take it in the first place. I know I've taken a lot of objectives, sometimes by myself and sometimes with a few other scared soldiers, and been driven off more than half of them. Why? Because it's easier to take the objective than it is to hold on to it. It's true in the military. It's true in the use of any instrument of foreign policy, it's true in business, and it's true in our daily lives. And I hate to keep harping on marriage, because I've, I've, I've been married on and off for a very long time. <laughs> well, I was in for 12, I was in for 12, I was, I was, I was on parole for two, and I'm back in for 34, so. <laughs> a lifer. Um, but, but even marriage is like, it's easy to get married. Remember this, it's easy to get married. It takes much more effort to stay married. And every human endeavor is like that. And by the way, one last thing, uh, and that has to do with combat and fear and so on. Anybody who tells you he was in combat and wasn't scared is a lion dog. And, uh, and, and skip has my address and phone number and you can tell him and he can come visit me and I'll tell him to his face. I mean, he's either lying or he's a psycho. And since they're not mutually exclusive, he may be a lying psycho. I, I can't think of a time that I wasn't scared in combat and when I wasn't scared in combat, I was scared that I would soon be in combat. Now, there's a Medal of Honor recipient named Bud Hawk who said very cleverly and quite appropriately that that valor in combat is not an absence of fear. An absence of fear is an absence of intelligence. But valor in combat is, uh, is overcoming fear because you love your comrades. And remember this about all of our veterans. Uh, they strive very, very hard. They work, they fight to achieve the mission. They fight to, uh, to defend the republic. Most of all, they fight for each other. 
And once they come back, it's vitally important also that we remember that they are part of us and we can't forget them. I know I'm preaching to the converted because we have here people who are supporting our troops as much as, and as fast as they possibly can. I'm not on behalf of anybody. As an American, I want to thank you for what you're doing. I want to thank Roger and the entire SIT family for what they've started. It's now out of control, thank goodness. And we want to keep it out of control and make it bigger and as, as, as effective as we possibly can. I want to thank all of you for what you're doing, not just for Minnesota. I know you're doing it for Minnesota in your heart. And you know you're doing it for individual troops in your heart. But what you're really doing is that you're a small group of people are actually doing it for the entire United States of America. And the thing that I have to do, I have, I have committed myself now to doing, is to take this story everywhere I go. Uh, God bless you. Thank you for what you're doing. God bless America. Thank you so much, uh, Colonel Jacobs. It's uh, an honor to come up here, independent of the size of this. I can assure you that uh, your stature in all of our minds is extraordinarily high, and we're deeply grateful to have you here this evening. Uh, for those of you who would like to have, please just send another round of applause. For those of you who would like some more of Colonel Jacobs' wisdom, his autographed book is out front. The proceeds will go to MMAF. I'm not sure whether it covers marital advice, but um, I think that uh, that's extra and available for personal consultation after the evening. So, uh, but again, thank you so much. There's a number of uh, folks I would like to wrap up the evening with a couple of comments. First of all, let's start with some thanks. Uh, Heidi Collins, thank you so much. She had to leave to conduct her evening duties. She did a great job and is deeply committed to our cause. Uh, you'll see Heidi at more and more events for MMAF. Uh, she deeply cares about this activity and the folks who serve. So let's give a round of applause to Heidi Collins. <laughs> also, one more round of applause for the, the uh, Red Bull Band and the, uh, the great work they've done this evening. Part of the privilege of, of uh, being a part of MMAF is the opportunity to introduce folks who don't have a regular opportunity to interact with people who've served and their families to the extraordinary group of people who make up the men and women who serve and, and their families. I think tonight you saw from Kiana, from Corporal Elliott, and certainly from Colonel Jacobs, a cross-section of folks who are doing things of extraordinary uh, honor, dignity, courage, perseverance. Uh, they teach us so much. They inspire us a great deal. And what I'd love to share with you is that as a part of the MMAF process, it's not that you see these folks just one, once in a while. This is a reflection of the deep, deep cross-section of the folks who are in our broader military community and their families. We are very, very grateful for all that you do, and we're honored to give, have a chance to show just a small portion, just a tip of the iceberg, of the great capability, courage, and dignity that is a part of our military community. So thank you for what you've done tonight. Kiana, Corporal Elliott, and Colonel Jacobs, uh, you inspire us, and we're uh, honored to be here to show a little bit of appreciation for what you've done for us. So in closing, there's a couple of things you can do. One, uh, donate. We would love to see additional financial contributions. There's envelopes on your table. Please consider a donation either now or as you do your end of year philanthropic uh, uh, gifts. The other opportunity is to follow up on what a couple of our speakers, including Colonel Jacobs, highlighted tonight. We've got an extraordinarily capable group of folks who are out there looking for work, who are back, who've been serving, and uh, they're looking for just a chance, a chance to come into your organization, your company, and make a difference and bring all of that skill and talent and all that discipline and all that stuff that we're so proud of and what we see the men and women of the U.S. military do on a day-to-day -day basis, to bring it into your company. What a powerful force for uh, good business outcomes and just, frankly, the right thing to do. So keep an eye inside your company. Ask the question inside your business. What can we do to make sure we're doing everything possible to give those folks who served the chance uh, to work in our business? So in closing, I'd like you to all please stand 
uh, as our honor guard retires our flag and the Red Bull Band performs one final rendition of God Bless America. And at the end, we hope you have safe travels home. Thank you. Thank you again, everybody. Good evening.